Awesome. Thank you, Raina. I want to come to the UNO tournament. <laughs> oh, please come. It's in December. There will be more information about it soon. So if, if that's if you're interested in that, I'll pass on that information. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. That's so cool. Um, all right. So we could get started talking about our noisy neighbors. And again, we have a lot of links uh, in the chat that are uh, useful uh, bits of information to use um, you know, after the program if you want to do more uh, research on the side. Um, and if you have questions throughout the program, please toss them in the chat. We'll be checking uh, as we go, and hopefully we can um, answer those uh, as we go. Um, and then we'll also have time at the end for questions. And we have this set for um, an hour and a half. We usually don't go the full hour and a half, uh, but we just allow that time um, in case anybody has a lot of burning questions. We're here <laughs> to answer them for you. All right, here we go. So. Uh, today, it's probably hard to imagine a time when there weren't, um, you know, deer munching on your uh, flowers out in your yard, um, or if there's raccoons, um, you know, digging in your trash cans. Um, but at one point, many of our um, critters here in Rhode Island uh, were actually in a bit of peril. Um, so uh, we've had uh, a definite change of attitude towards wildlife over our uh, over the course of our history. Um, of course, you know, prior to European settlement, indigenous people uh, were here and managing the land and using uh, natural resources right here in Rhode Island uh, long before Europeans arrived uh, and still continue to do so to this day. And um, when the Europeans did arrive, they also were utilizing natural resources um, and were trading with indigenous tribes to um, provide food and uh, pelts for clothing, uh, et cetera. But the big problem with the Europeans was that not only were they subsistence uh, hunting, trapping, gathering, they were also um, sending a lot back to Europe. So we saw a huge drop off in many of our uh, native species uh, here in Rhode Island and across the East Coast. Um, and there were no laws in place, of course, uh, it was just kind of a free for all. Um, and of course, as uh, more people started to arrive, uh, we start seeing cities pop up. Uh, there was the advent of market hunting, uh, which is where you could, you know, go out and harvest over a hundred ducks in a day. And that's obviously not very sustainable, um, but they were harvesting large quantities of animals to sell at the market, just like you would buy, uh, you know, chicken uh, at the market today, you could buy wild uh, harvested duck. Uh, so a lot of animals disappeared from Rhode Island's landscape, and um, it was even hard to like find things like wild turkeys um, in Rhode Island. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> now we've got people calling us about them. Get them off my lawn. Um, and now our wildlife populations have recovered uh, to the point where uh, some of our, our animals are considered nuisance wildlife. So what happened in between to get these um, animals back to uh, an abundant uh, status. And that uh, ties back to the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. And this is um, our major and uh, main source of funding here in Rhode Island and across the country for state wildlife agencies. Um, so this uh, ties back to the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. And basically the way it works is that uh, anglers, boaters, hunters, um, shooting sports participants are going to buy their equipment, um, whether that's archery equipment or a shotgun, um, ammunition, and uh, the manufacturers have already paid an excise tax on that merchandise, which is collected by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and they allocate those funds to each of the states. And then we have to use it for habitat acquisition uh, through preserving uh, habitat through our wildlife management area system. Uh, we use it for research, for monitoring, for education, uh, both through our wildlife outreach program and uh, aquatic resource education program and our hunter education program. Um, so it is protected that way. So it cannot be used to like fill the potholes on the highway, right? It has to be used for wildlife and the benefit of um, conserving our wildlife. So then that way, the folks who are using the resource, you know, the hunters and the anglers um, who are harvesting the, um, those wildlife resources in a controlled, regulated and ethical manner um, are able to benefit from their um, contribution to uh, conservation. And then everybody benefits, all, you know, all users of um, wildlife management areas benefit uh, by having a place to hike, to bike, to walk the dog, to bird watch. Um, so this is a wonderful, wonderful source of funding for us. Um, and it really um, has helped recover many of our wildlife uh, species over the course of time. 
So you're probably here this evening uh, because you have had some unwanted neighbors move into either your home or your yard or underneath the, the porch. Um, so you're like, all right, where are the solutions, right? Uh, so today we're going to focus on these three species, squirrels, bats, and raccoons. Um, and we do this uh, seasonally. So uh, we'll also have um, some sessions in January, May, and uh, July of next year, focusing on nocturnal nuisances. So the, uh, the coyotes, fisher, bobcat will have a uh, bumbling babies, <laughs> which will focus on um, fawns and baby birds. And um, that's in May. And then in July, we'll have our veggie vandals program focusing on rabbits, deer, and woodchucks. So if you don't hear about a critter that is causing a problem for you tonight, there are more of these um, seasonal solutions uh, series. Um, so we'll talk about the life history and behaviors of these animals and that knowing just a little bit about um, how they live their lives can really be helpful in um, understanding what is driving them to cause the problem in our homes. And then uh, once we understand them a little bit more, then we can kind of focus on those strategies to deal with them in a humane way. Ah, so I am actually going to start talking a little bit about the raccoon. Um, you know, a lot of things of why these wildlife interact so much with us is that they are looking for food and shelter and we have food and shelter. So we're, why not come and visit us a little bit, I guess. Um, raccoons tend to be a habitat, habitat generalist, which means they can pretty much live anywhere, um, not only in the wild, but in areas that are kind of closer to us, whether it's in our attics or in sheds or anything um, that seems like a nice uh, hospitable environment for them to live in. Um, the actual scientific name for uh, raccoon is uh, Procyon Lotor, which means uh, the washer. And one of the things that people kind of recognize or have seen with, um, with raccoons is actually they'll wash their food prior to eating it. So it kind of gives them a little bit of a human, human-esque um, characteristic. So it makes them super cute when they're washing a little bit before they have a snack. Um, and naturally, uh, raccoons will eat seeds and fruits, uh, but they're also known to eat uh, insects and eggs, as well as small, small mammals, birds, um, sometimes fish. Um, but around most humans, uh, one of the things that they like to get into is our trash or our bird seed when we're trying to feed our birds at home. Um, or if someone might be happening to feed a cat outside, they will definitely get into cat food. Um, the raccoons are also known to get into um, chicken coops. Um, primarily a raccoon is a nocturnal um, uh, species. So that means that they're going to be awake at night and very active at those times. Um, they're going to start to get active around um, dusk and dawn. Um, and you don't tend to see them moving around quite uh, often during the summer, or I'm sorry, during the daylight hours, but um, that will tend to be, um, if they have young, you might see them out during the day. Um, they will tend to stay in um, a, a den and then move along unless they are raising young. Um, and the other kind of neat thing about raccoons is that they can actually open locks or open latches. Um, so that's why they can get into our garbage cans. Um, and they're very, very easy at knowing how to find where food sources are. And some of the times uh, when raccoons are active, uh, in the wintertime, they don't tend to hibernate. Um, so they, you'll see a little bit of activity um, in the wintertime. During the spring is where um, breeding will occur. It occurs between February um, and then through June um, is when the breeding activity happens. Um, and then our young are actually born in the summer. Um, You'll typically, a raccoon would uh, den in tree cavities, but sometimes you'll find them in your chimneys um, or other man-made structures. Um, in, in the raccoon world, the females will be the ones raising their young. Um, and one of the neat kind of things about raccoons is uh, as they are just born, um, their eyes and their ears are actually closed um, for the first three weeks of life. So they are completely helpless. Uh, dependent upon mom to help them. Um, and so mom will, you know, start to uh, associate them, uh, get them out and get them, uh, as they get older, they'll go out to feed. And that's why you might see some of that daytime activity with mom. Um, but again, as they get older, they're going to start um, 
going back to those kind of nocturnal be behaviors. Um, but the young will stay with mom through fall. So mom stays in a family unit um, almost until wintertime when they start to den up again. Ah, yes. And here's our, our other favorite little friend that a lot of us see. Uh, you can go anywhere in Rhode Island and see um, squirrels. Uh, one of the most common um, squirrel uh, here in Rhode Island would be um, the gray squirrel, but we do have three different types or species of tree squirrels in Rhode Island. We've got um, gray squirrels, red squirrels, and then we also have flying squirrels. Um, Chipmunks and woodchucks are also um, something that you might see on the ground and they're considered a ground squirrel, but not what we would think of when we think of squirrels. Um, red squirrels tend to not be a noisy neighbor for us or because um, red squirrels will tend to habitate in um, conifer trees. Um, what we're typically going to have interactions with are gray squirrels. Um, they love to, um, they are diurnal, so they are day and night, they're just like us. They're awake during the day um, and then they sleep at night. Um, but our other squirrel friend, our flying squirrel, they tend to be nocturnal. Um, so they are going to be very active at night. Um, maybe that's why I don't get to see them. I'd love to see one. Um, they're so cute. They're super cute when they fly. And But um, typically where we're gonna find those squirrels in our home, they're gonna go up into our attics and into our chimneys. Um, they, they are, frequently over by our bird feeders, which sometimes can be a nuisance. Um, but gray squirrels are going to be the most common that we see. And they love um, to be in what we call a mast bearing tree. So those are trees that um, produce nuts. And um, if you've looked outside anytime lately, uh, acorns are abundant. Uh, so an a oak tree would be considered a mast tree. Um, so those nocturnal, i um, sorry, those uh, squirrels are out there collecting up a lot of those acorns and they're going to be um, burying those acorns and caching those acorns or storing those acorns for the winter. So you're gonna see a lot of that activity, especially right now. Uh, and talking a little bit about um, that activity, <laughs> um, the three species of tree heart squirrels are active all year round, uh, but you will find them kind of getting into that den um, activity during the colder months where um, they don't want to go outside as much as we don't want to go outside. Um, so they will begin to build nests. Um, one of the neat things about having all the leaves fall off the trees right now is we'll actually kind of see like a big ball of leaves upside up in a tree. And that's actually going to be a squirrel nest and you can call that a dray. Um, so you'll see the squirrels up in their nest up there, but sometimes if they're not um, in a dray, they may be in our attic. Um, they'll sometimes they'll den up in chimneys as well. Um, and that's how they kind of make their way into our homes. Um, they don't mean to, but that's just what they find is a nice and invi warm inviting uh, environment for them. Um, typically with flying squirrels, they could den up to with a group of up to 10 squirrels at once. Um, so they, they like that group um, denning activity so they can stay nice and warm uh, as opposed to being an individual squirrel in a nest. Um, so with tree squirrels, they typically will reproduce twice a year um, in the springtime as well as um, in late summer. Um, red squirrels are less likely to um, reproduce twice I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> breeding occurs uh, in January and February and again in May and June. And I always tend to find May and June is when you're really going to see that activity. You're going to see those squirrels that are running out into the road and you're slamming on your brakes and it's like, ah, squirrels. Um, when they do have their young, squirrels will have up to three babies on average. Um, but flying squirrels can give birth to between um, two to seven um, young. So little, nice little litters there. Um, the young can be, um, one of the challenges sometimes in the spring is that young can be found on the ground. Um, baby, baby squirrels fall out of nests um, or there might've been a big windstorm. So that's when they're gonna fall out as well as um, if there were any tree work, sometimes those nests get knocked around. Um, and that's one thing that um, mom will try and find them. Uh, females will try and uh, grab the babies and take care of them. So one time, one thing that we should be cognizant of is not trying to pick up a squirrel immediately until you actually realize that there may be a challenge and we don't want to pick them up. Uh, you'd want to call a wildlife rehabber um, and kind of get their opinion on the situation. They might ask you how long you've seen this baby squirrel. They're going to ask you some questions to figure out whether what the best choice of action would be for a baby squirrel.
And that so, number is in the chat. Yes, well. yeah, we did put that in there. So you can look at our, um, it's under, let's see. I'm it's actually gonna do these again yeah, because nice. um, we had a couple of folks join us and I don't know if it lets you see them if you joined after we shared something in the chat. So I'm gonna put them back in the chat again. There's a great uh, wildlife rehab facility and they can answer questions for you and then direct you to the best course of action anytime you find young wildlife. Um, right now, the three different species of squirrels that we have in our state, they're gonna be getting ready for winter. So they're gonna start caching that food. Like I said, they're gonna be storing those acorns, burying them in holes, or they're gonna store them in tree cavities. Um, sometimes you might find that little cache in your attic. Um, but the other great thing about this is that they're actually helping plant trees uh, because the squirrel can't possibly remember everywhere that they buried some of those acorns. So uh, we've got a lot of plant dispersal or seed dispersal uh, through the process of squirrels <laughs> in the winter Forgetting. time. <laughs> Forgetting. Oops, I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. All right, we'll jump into bats. Uh, so bats are another little critter that tend to be in people's attics um, year round too. This can be an issue, not just in the fall. Uh, so in Rhode Island, we have eight species uh, that can be present and some are more common than others. Uh, so we have the big brown bat, little brown bat, silver haired, hoary bat, northern long eared, eastern small footed, eastern red bat, and tricolored. Um, so the rarest in Rhode Island, I would say, is the northern long eared that's federally listed. Um, as endangered and the eastern small-footed bat. Uh, we're technically in their geographic range, but we really don't see them. We did find one uh, <laughs> just uh, last winter or the winter before um, in one of our hibernacula surveys. And we can talk about what a hibernacula is um, and how we do those surveys in a little bit. Uh, but the most commonly found one that you're going to find in your home is the big brown bat. They're notorious um, attic dwellers. Um, Eastern red bats are a very common species in the state as well, but they are tree roosting bats. So they're gonna be tucking themselves underneath little bits of bark um, and uh, tucking themselves in little holes and trees. Uh, all of our bats are insectivores in Rhode Island. So they're eating mosquitoes, moths, beetles, uh, providing essential ecosystem services uh, to us by eating those pesky bugs that cause disease and also uh, wreak havoc on our gardens. Um, so, and we have a question here from uh, Tom. I see it sometimes hear noises in the attic. How can I tell if it's bats? And if they are, who do I call to remove them? Ah, we will answer that in a little bit. So hang tight, Tom, uh, and we'll get you that answer. Oops, I'm gonna click here. All right, so bats are mating in the fall. This is their uh, mating season as they're moving, um, you know, north or south, uh, depends on the species. Uh, so. During this time of year, most of our bats should have left for the year, with the exception of those big brown bats that decide to hang around in an attic or an old structure. Um, and that's that's what we call the hibernacula, right? The place where they are hibernating. Uh, we have a handful of hibernacula in the state that are old stone structures um, where they kind of tuck themselves into crevices and um, or they'll go down, you know, into kind of some tunnels. And we do survey those uh, annually. I have been on one and it was like, Oh, oh my, like, you know, it's, it's cold, it's uh, damp, it is, um, you know, not a place that you really want to be uh, on, on the regular, but the bats, that is their preferred environment uh, for the winter, something cooler and damp. Um, uh, but sometimes they'll be in, you know, an attic or a chimney. And um, the, those tree bats, again, the red bat, uh, the hoary bat, uh, silver hair, they roost in trees uh, during the year, and they'll actually migrate south. Uh, for the winter. Um, so big browns, uh, little browns, uh, northern long eared they're moving north. Uh, if they're not going into like some sort of a man-made structure, they'll be in a natural cave or um, rock crevice. But um, our tree bats will go down south where there are insects all winter long, and they'll um, either tuck themselves under a pile of leaves on the forest floor, uh, which I think is just the most adorable thing. <laughs> a little bat just like tucking himself in uh, underneath some oak leaves. Uh, or they will um, find a nice tree cavity to spend the winter in. Um, and they are true hibernators. They do, their body, you know, shuts down, their, or their body functions slow down, and they do not eat during the winter. Um, and if anybody's heard of white nose syndrome, this is um, a, a disease that um, is affecting bats that hibernate in northern climates that are in, um, you know, those damp 
cool cave environments. This is a fungus that grows on their face and on their wing membranes. And as um, we've lost millions of bats to this disease. Um, and it seems like it's tapering off a little bit. Some bats are resistant. It looks like um, depends on their selection of hibernacula, uh, whether or not um, they have been able to survive or resist uh, the disease or even avoid it. Um, but we have seen our bat populations uh, decline here in Rhode Island of, um, of little browns particularly. Um, we have one more person in the waiting room, hang tight. There we go. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's another reason why we um, survey in the winter to check. Uh, so we we do have white nose syndrome here in Rhode Island. It's in our hibernacula, um, and uh, we um, are always on the lookout for um, uh, our bats um, perishing due to that. And basically, what it does to them is it messes up their hibernation cycle. It wakes them up. They burn through their energy reserves faster. So if you're in a slow state of um, you know, metabolism as you're hibernating, you're not using up your fat reserves that you've uh, put all that work into storing uh, all, uh, all fall. But uh, if you keep waking up and keep waking up and moving around, you're gonna burn through that energy faster. And of course, in the winter, there's no bugs to eat. Uh, so most of the bats um, uh, die of uh, starvation or exposure to the elements uh, when they contract white nose syndrome. Um, so come April, uh, the bats will begin to make their way back to their summer homes uh, to have their young. Uh, so the female, so the males and females have mated in the fall. Uh, the females will be gestating uh, or delayed gestation. Um, as, and then when they get to their maternity roost, um, they'll have their pups. Uh, so big browns and little browns roost in maternity colonies. Uh, so all the females will get together. They'll gather in one place and have their uh, pups. Um, and usually these are um, in warmer spaces like an old barn, an attic, um, you know, so that the, the pups can stay warm because they're born without hair. Um, and then uh, we, um, uh, they'll, they'll also give birth to uh, one pup per year. Uh, so that's the issue with white nose syndrome. You have a huge die off of all of these bats. You have one pup per year per female. So that's a slower uptick in your population in recovery. Um, but red bats can give birth to up to three uh, uh, pups per year, which is pretty cool. Uh, so around mid July, the pups uh, begin flying. And um, this is a time where sometimes you can find young bats in a home because they just or like that, ah, how did I get in here? You know, they found their way in to the interior part of your home or they might be on the ground outside of homes uh, because they're just trying to figure out where to go. And so um, here at Fish and Wildlife, we have a really strong uh, bat program. It's pretty active. Uh, it's run by uh, Jennifer Brooks, who's also our volunteer coordinator. And we have several different projects that are going on um, that are studying our state's bats. Um, so first are those maternity roost counts. Uh, this is a wonderful volunteer oh, opportunity. Yes, say, if you're volunteers. interested, uh, contact <laughs> Abby or contact Jen. Uh, this is a very relaxing summertime activity. You sit in the lawn chair with a little clicker and you click and you watch the bats come out of the uh, um, out of their roost one by one. Uh, so it's a nice, easy count. Uh, and you get to see them doing all sorts of acrobatics in the air. Uh, so we do that once at the beginning of the season when just the moms are flying around and then we do it again uh, when um, the pups are flying. So we can get an estimate of how many moms and then how many young uh, were produced from that colony. We also do mist netting uh, throughout the summer. So this is um, a, a band, a numbered band on this bat. So mist netting uh, is when you set up this big tall, it's like 20 feet tall, it's on a pulley system and it's a very thin, um, lightweight net that the bats will fly into and they just get a little tangled. We check it once every five minutes so they're not in there um, very long if they do get caught. And uh, they're gently extracted, they're weighed, they're measured. Uh, we check to see if they're male or female, if they're pregnant or lactating. And then uh, they get this little numbered armband. And this is truly their arm. Um, so this uh, is their forearm bone that it goes on. And then uh, that little nub there is the wrist, the thumb. Uh, is that little claw that sticks off the top of the wing. And then all the bones of the wing are their fingers. So they have the same uh, bones that we do. We're all mammals, right? So we have the same bones. They just look different. And this little uh, band sits just like a bracelet. It doesn't harm the bat. It's very lightweight. doesn't uh, hinder their flight. And uh, this is a really low tech way of learning about bats. So we will, um, you know, hopefully if we can recapture a bat. Uh, it has happened before. Uh, Charlie, uh, our previous bat biologist who just recently retired, 
um, caught one bat that he had banded six years earlier. We caught it again in the same uh, area, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've also had biologists in Vermont report bands uh, of wintering bats saying, oh, we've got you know a Rhode Island bat here in this cave in Vermont. Uh, so we know uh, exactly where they're going to over winter, which is pretty cool. So very low tech. Uh, another high tech way that we are uh, working on bats and this is a partner project we're you know we're not um deploying the high technology uh we're, we're working with the researcher out of virginia tech uh mike true who's uh studying the migration behavior of eastern red bats and um he's using cell towers to uh, track them so each bat so he was trying to get to a bunch of different states who are misnetting for bats get uh you know a representative of you know a regional population of red bats um so he came to rhode island uh on our misnetting surveys and if we caught a red bat then he put um, a little teensy weensy transmitter on it. It's amazing how the technology has advanced um, in making this little tiny, tiny transmitter with a little antenna on it that fits on the bat with a little backpack and they, um, they're light enough that it does not uh, hinder their flight at all. And um, that gives us information about the movements of bats, um, more fine scale movements of bats, which is really, really cool. Um, and then the last thing that we do are acoustic surveys. So this is um, you know, a driving route. So Jen will strap a bat detector to uh, one of our trucks or she'll strap it to a tree in like a stable area um, and leave it up for a week or so. And um, this bat detector will pick up the echolocation calls of the bats. So just like you can identify a blue jay from a chickadee based on their song, you can tell the difference between the bat species based on their echolocation calls, but they're too high pitched for us to hear. So we need a special device in order to help us um, hear them. And then it creates this little, um, this little uh, physical representation of the, um, of the call. So you can see the frequency, like the swooshes and the drops of the call. Uh, so each one has a different pattern. Um, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty accurate. Sometimes it glitches and it'll tell you like a bat that doesn't occur in Rhode Island. I'm like, eh, it's probably not, probably not the right bat. Um, but it is very cool uh, to see that. Okay, so conflicts with these critters. Um, I've touched on all of these conflicts a little bit and Abby has as well. Um, and you're probably tuning in because of one of these issues. Um, so, uh, you know, these are some conflicts that we can have with all three of these topic species. Um, so squirrels, especially can do a huge damage um, on your wires in your attic, um, woodwork as well. They love to chew on wood. Um, uh, all of these animals can utilize uh, your home for a nesting or a roosting space, um, raising their young, hibernating in the winter. Uh, so our homes are very inviting to them. Um, and with these animals in our homes, uh, there's also the waste products that come uh, from them. So a lot of droppings, uh, urine and droppings can soak into the insulation in your home. It can get into the woodwork. It could cause an awful smell. It can cause some health hazards. Um, for bats, particularly histoplasmosis is one of those um, health hazards. It's an infection uh, that can get into your lungs. You can also get it from dried bird droppings. Um, so uh, if you, you know, ever find bat droppings, even if it's just like outside on your front step, uh, we, you know, we get them out here and <laughs> the bats will roost outside of our porch here at the office. There'll be little bat droppings. You always want to wet down those droppings, even bird droppings, wet those down first with a little bucket or your hose um, and then sweep them away or wash them away. Uh, so you're tamping down any dust that's going to come off of those droppings. Um, you can always, of course, wear a mask as well while cleaning those. Um, raccoons uh, can transmit raccoon roundworm. Uh, that's a nematode that can lead to any some life-threatening complications. So definitely do not want to <laughs> come into contact with raccoon feces. Um, and your pets can be also at risk of these diseases as well. Um, so we're gonna and yeah, we've shift a little bit. A few, <laughs> a a few uh, wildlife nuisances, but of course we all know that there's a little bit more than just bats and squirrels and raccoons. Um, we've got possums and mice and, and even snakes. Um, so some of the strategies that we're about to share with you are kind of the strategies that you could use if you happen to think you might have um, a mouse in your house um, in some ways that you can kind of help alleviate those challenges. Well, possums, that always makes me laugh that we include possums because they're just so, they might get into your garage or your shed, but they are just so benign. Um, <laughs> they are not rabies vector species. They do not contract rabies. Um, they eat ticks. Yeah. They... Um, the worst thing they do, I think, is get into trash and then find their way into your garage um, and then play dead. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, but they can be a problem if they if they get into places where they shouldn't. It's my PSA. I love opossums. 
Um, and I hope that this might help uh, Tom a little bit with some of his questions about what may be um, in his attic. Um, but the first thing we want to think about is uh, when we're thinking about who might be in our home is try to start to look for some of those clues. Like, is it a bat? Is it a raccoon? Um, and some of the big things that we can do is um, look for droppings um, or any tracks that you might see near your home. Uh, raccoons tend to be nocturnal. So if you start to hear those noises at night, you might hear a little bit of scratching. Um, and if it's only at night, it may be a, a raccoon, uh, loud shuffling noises, sometimes some growling. Um, and a raccoon will lead, uh, leave a very distinct track um, in your yard. Almost looks like, almost looks like uh, I read an article saying baby footprints <laughs> with very long fingers <laughs> or very long toes. Um, so you might see some of those tracks. Um, you might also see some of their scat or their droppings. Um, scratch marks are very big um, or staining around entry points because they've got that body that they're kind of getting into um, the holes to get into an attic perhaps. Um, so you might see some staining at those points. Um, squirrels, you might hear a little bit of scratching. And like we said, they were diurnal. So you're gonna get a little bit of that day daytime noise, uh, less noise at night from squirrels, but a little bit of scratching. Um, if you happen to pop, up into your attic, you might see you might see those caches of um, acorns, or you might see where they've stored um, and torn some insulation in your attic to try and make a nice um, place to lay down and to, to den up. Again, those chewed wires, um, squirrels are, are uh, wonderful for chewing wires, not that we want it to happen because it's, it's costly to repair. Um, you can also find sometimes in your woodwork, in your attic, um, an accumulation of urine. You'll see that water staining. Um, you can also, with bats, you're gonna be looking for the bat guano um, or the bat droppings, because that's a really indicative of whether you have bats or not. Um, and you can also see it as they're flying into your home. You might see some of that uh, staining down your siding. Um, so you might see some bat uh, staining that would indicate that you possibly have some bats uh, living in your attic. They're gonna be under the louvers. Um, if you have shutters, they're gonna be under those shutters. Um, they can sometimes go right underneath um, what's the word I'm looking for? The shingles on your home, yeah, you might see them in there, cedar shakes. Um, bats too, you're gonna see them leaving at, um, at dusk. So you're gonna see that exit and enter of the animal at that time. Um, so some things you can do is make sure you're looking for any tracks, um, any scat or droppings. Um, and one neat thing that you can do is you could also um, utilize a trail camera. Um, you can borrow one from a friend. Um, I know in my town, my library actually has the ability to borrow a trail cam. So you can take that camera, you can set it up where you think that entrance and exit is of that animal, get some um, documentation, and then you kind of know what you're working with. And then this poop right here, also like the scat, this one to me, it looks like bat guano so it's usually about the size of a grain of rice raccoons poop in piles <laughs> they look like tootsie rolls yeah. that's the way i can think of it um, and then squirrels is going to be a little bit bigger than the the bat poop um it's going to be you know looking for seeds and things like that um so now like how do we stop the animals from coming into our home and and causing the damage that's getting really really frustrating um so the first thing that we want to do is a we've already talked about identifying them so we've we've identified what we may have living in our home, but now we want to get them out. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can reach out um, to a nuisance wildlife control specialist. And those um, individuals are actually uh, licensed by Rhode Island DEM. Um, in our chat, we have added um, those lists and links to different phone numbers so that you can actually um, kind of get some resources. Um, because what a licensed um, nuisance wildlife control specialist can do is they're actually going to help assist in the exclusion process. Now, it is going to cost a fee, um, so they will charge for their services. Um, the state DEM, we do not remove animals um, from homes. Um, we would have to refer you to one of these individuals. Um, if you choose to try and work on it on your own, though, um, there are some helpful, helpful hints here. Uh, if you choose to exclude them, you want to make sure that you are considering your safety. Uh, you never want to directly handle um, an animal at all. But now is kind of the best time to do that since the young have left any sort of den or nest. And we know that they're living independently. Um, so we want to make sure that we're 
starting that exclusion process in this this fall time that we're in right now. Uh, you want to expect, inspect your home and identify what animal is causing the problem. And then you're going to try and locate where that animal came in. So if you're able to get that trail cam or just watching it with your own eyes, you have a great spot. Um, sometimes you can start to just scare them by using loud noises. Um, ammonia soaked rags uh, can also be something that can deter um, animals because they don't like that odor. Um, scent um, lights and loud sounds can also be something to encourage an animal to exit your living spaces. Um, it's usually effective for raccoons, especially when they're in your chimney. And then once that animal is gone, you want to close up, um, especially if it's your chimney, you want to close that up with a chimney cap to keep the raccoons from coming back in. When it comes to squirrels, you're going to want to apply some traps inside the places where you think that um, you see droppings and near the entrances. Um, and once you're confident um, that they have left the area, um, you can actually close up the spaces with a wire mesh. Um, but remember, squirrels, they love to chew on wires. Um, so those kind of rubbery coated wires or um, they got in there by kind of opening up that hole a little bit more. So they'll chew on wood or plastics. So you're going to want to make sure that you're using a wire mesh um, to keep um, the squirrels out. Um, and you want to make sure that you're using a one-way excluder. So you're keeping them so they're in, they're gonna, not going to be able to get in, but if there's someone still stuck inside, they're a way to get out. Um, and then for bats, you're just going to want to go outside and look uh, to make sure they're exiting and entering. And then you can kind of use one of those excluders around those main exit holes that they're in. And again, that's the, the nuisance wildlife control specials can help you. Yes. This, like, <laughs> this is option. involved, right? <laughs> so like, I don't know, mesh, what size? Uh, you can always call them. And once you make sure that all of those animals are gone, um, there's some, some things that you can use. Um, we were talking about the, the chimney caps. Um, so you want to cover all possible entrances um, with like a one fourth inch um, galvanized steel mesh. And you want to make sure that extends about six inches past that original hole um, to, in all directions. And that will help prevent any squirrels from re-entering. Um, they love to get in, uh, squirrels especially, will try to get in through dryer vents um, or any type of vent that you have in your home. And they do actually have a specialized dryer vent flap that will um, prevent uh, squirrels from re-entering the home through that. Um, and when you want to try to chimney proof or animal proof your chimney, um, they actually sell a commercial cap. And that cap, um, you want to make sure that when you purchase it and put it in, that's ab abiding by the fire codes that are set forth in the state. Um, another thing we were thinking about those squirrels that like to get under our shingles, if you replace any of those shingles, um, you can secure that and hopefully not have um, any bats visiting you. Um, and another way too is like, well, how did they even get up to my roof? If you have any overhanging limbs, um, make sure you trim those up and it kind of breaks down or, or reduces the highway that the animals were utilizing to get into your home. <laughs> and then um, this is kind of probably one of the bigger challenges is actually trying to remove some attractants. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we always ask people when they're having a challenge with a nuisance wildlife is like, can you do a yard audit and see what you might have um, that's attracting these animals into your yard uh, and then finding these great um, shelters within your own home? Because remember, animals want shelter and they want food. Uh, so maybe we're providing something that makes our um, homes um, really hospitable and a great place for those the wildlife to want to come there. Um, so we want to make sure we are removing the food source now. Um, so in the state of Rhode Island, it is illegal to feed wildlife. So we're talking, you don't want to be out and, and feeding the coyote in your backyard um, and attracting that wildlife into your yard. Um, bird feeders are exempt from that. We can have bird feeders, um, but bird feeders can sometimes be a challenge um, when it comes to bringing those raccoons into our yard or our squirrels. Um, so we want to make sure that it's a little less accessible for those animals. We want to make sure that it's raised and set away from the house. You don't want your bird feeder super close to your home. Um, any seeds that fall down from your feeder. Um, I know it's sometimes a lot because sometimes you get some wily blue jay in there that's taking everything and, and spreading the seeds everywhere. But if you can kind of sweep up the seeds and that kind of helps eliminate the attractants for mice, because mice really love to get into that seed as well as um, raccoons will kind of like, oh, this is a great place to hang out. I can get some seed that's nice um, fatty proteins that they can use to build up um, their fat stores before the winter. Um, 
but we also, um, you don't really need to feed wild birds between April and November because they're getting a lot of their seed source from native plants um, in the area. Um, and that kind of helps eliminate having that extra seed and tractant in your yard in the early parts of the season. Um, we wanna make sure that we're securing our garbage cans, especially those, those raccoons with those little hands, they might be getting into our um, garbage cans. And we wanna kind of avoid that. Um, sometimes we have pets that we're trying to feed outside. And if we do have a pet we're feeding outside, we wanna make sure that once the animal or once your pet is done consuming the food, we wanna pull that food back in. Um, so we're not bringing a raccoon on the porch to finish up the cat food. Um, another thing too is compost piles. Uh, you know, a raccoon might find a nice ear of corn in your compost pile, and that's because it's nice and exposed. So if we can keep our compost bins uh, covered, that would keep um, some of this nuisance wildlife out of uh, so close, being so close to our homes. And um, chicken coops are a challenge, especially uh, for raccoons or, or individuals that own chickens. The raccoons are a challenge for them. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, to try and keep raccoons out, we want to keep um, the doors locked and latched, um, as well as if you have the mesh around, you want to make sure that's actually buried and goes down into the ground to keep the raccoons from getting under. And the other thing too is securing our chicken food uh, or chicken feed so that the raccoons aren't finding that as attractant as well. When we say buried, we mean like bury it a foot or more yeah. and then have it flare outwards. Um, and it's harder for them to, as they're digging and like, oh, I'm hitting the wire, I'm hitting the wire. Um, Another thing to mention on this slide is uh, we have this uh, website, wildlifehelp.org. Uh, so uh, Rhode Island is part of it, and there's many states uh, on there as well. All you have to do is go to that website, type in raccoon, Rhode Island. Like it tells you what animal do you have an issue with? Where do you live? And it'll bring you to, so if you forget everything that we just said, or if you want more details um, or anything, it tells you what you can do about that animal um, in with regards to like your state regulation so it tells you you know what is legal what's illegal etc um and it gives you a lot of information in one place um and that link is in our chat that is <laughs> yes wildlifehelp.org and one thing i will say i always do this as a plug if you're like oh i just really love feeding the birds um you know and you can't get rid of your bird food you just feel like you're gonna miss it so much uh planting native wild plants in your home garden is one of the best things you can do for birds 365 days a year because you're not only providing them with uh, shelter with those native plants you're providing uh, food for insects like butterflies like moths like uh, which are you know going to create caterpillars and that's what many or most birds feed their babies during the breeding season is caterpillars they're high protein high fat they're going to grow baby birds. Uh, they do not feed their babies seeds during the, the breeding season. They're going after insects. So if you can create a healthy mini ecosystem in your yard with native plants, produce those insects, you're going to have an awesome array of birds in your yard. Um, I can speak to this firsthand. I've done it. Uh, this is like my pet project, uh, restoring my my lawn to uh, native meadow. And um, and I leave those stems up right now. My, my yard is full of stems, full of seeds. I've had juncos and sparrows and chickadees, and they're all over the place eating the seeds um, that my plants are providing for them. Uh, so I actually don't even put up a bird feeder at all. Uh, I just let nature uh, feed uh, the birds uh, by itself, just by naturally doing that. And again, uh, the most effective uh, solution that we can have is simply to, um, if you just simply remove the animal and you don't take any of these um, precautions or no, I wouldn't say precautions, but if you don't take um, and try to avoid the attractants or um, close up the hole, something else will come in and live <laughs> in that space. So we want to try and make sure that we're solving that solution. And remember, the, the easiest thing to remember is food and shelter are what these animals are looking for. So if you can remove that, um, they're going to find their food and shelter elsewhere. They'll find it in the wild and not necessarily in your home. So we do um, have, you know, so th as Abby was saying, you know, that's your first uh, measure. Uh, oops, we have one more person coming in. There we go. Uh, that's, you know, the, the first course of action is reducing, um, you know, those, the access to those resources. Um, we always encourage doing that first rather than lethal removal of the animal. Um, because again, if you don't get rid of the attractant, you're going to be lethally removing squirrels forever uh, you know, if you don't close up the hole in the attic um so and and we always want to encourage people you know to do the most 
humane, um, you know, opt for the most humane option. And it, sometimes you do need to lethally trap an animal. Um, so there are rules and regulations for trapping in the state. Um, so you can set traps on your own property um, where you live without getting a trapping license. If you decide to trap, you know, recreation, recreationally, like uh, we know some people who trap beaver for fur, um, they trap raccoons uh, for fur, et cetera. Um, you know, if you're doing that on state land or private land or whatever, um, you do need to have a trapping license. Um, but if you're just doing this on your own home property, you do not. However, all of your season restrictions, your bag limits, the tagging requirements and other trapping laws and regulations do apply. Um, so you cannot use poisons or snares, steel jawed like traps, uh, you cannot use um, any deadfall or uh, pitfalls, fish hooks, treble hooks, um, sharpened instruments to catch, capture or injure animals. Um, that's all detailed in our hunting and trapping uh, abstract, but I want to say them now. Uh, poison is the main one that I really uh, try to hammer home with folks because you can buy it in the hardware store. It's sold. So you'd say, well, why do they sell it? Um, you know, because each state is different, but here in Rhode Island, it, no poison. Um, it's it's pretty inhumane. The animal does not die right away. Um, they're uh, essentially they hemorrhage to death if they bump into something. And then if another animal happens to eat that little mouse or squirrel or whatever, um, in the meantime, between that, you know, when they eat the poison and when they die, um, that hawk, owl, fox, fisher, or whatever is going to eat that animal can also be um, poisoned as well. Um, and there, there's somebody actually doing a study on it. <laughs> so there's like many, many of our small predators wandering around the Northeast um, have some level of rodenticide uh, in their body because they have um, consumed an animal that has um, contained poison. Um, and we have a note here that relocation is illegal in Rhode Island. And you might say, well, wait, we're talking about humane options. Isn't the most humane thing to do is to put it in a little have heart and then take them down the street and let them out into the woods. Um, that sounds humane in theory, um, but it can cause a lot of stress to the animal. It can also uh, spread disease either through, you know, you directly handling the animal or if that animal is sick with something that is not um, contagious to humans, but contagious to um, each other, uh, that can spread disease from one area to another if you don't know the animal is sick. Um, if it's a nuisance animal, <laughs> woodchucks are the one I'm thinking of really. The woodchucks are just like, oh, everybody's <laughs> like, I'll just take this and Lincoln Woods seems to be the place that everybody takes a woodchuck. I'll just let it go into Lincoln Woods um, and let it be free. Uh, but if you're moving that animal from one neighborhood to another, you have just deposited a lovely gift of a nuisance woodchuck who's going to eat somebody else's tomatoes in their garden or get into somebody else's, uh, you know, uh, porch or whatever it might be. Um, so we, you know, you don't want to give your problem to somebody else. Um, and then also, you know, animals have a home range, right? So if somebody stopped at your house today and said, okay, get in the car. I'm going to drive you 10 miles away down the street. It's a lovely location. You're going to totally enjoy it. And then they leave you there and say, you're going to live here now. And you say, well, I, I want to go home where, where my home is, right? So animals are pretty much the same way, right? They have a home range. They're going to want to get back to their home range uh, so they don't get into conflict with other animals in a different territory. And that can make them more susceptible to crossing more roads and getting hit by a car. So while um, relocation in theory seems like the best thing to do, it can sometimes cause unwanted problems um, or uh, negative repercussions for the animal. And that's not to say if you have relocated an animal before, uh, we're not coming after you. Uh, we're, this is not to make you feel bad. Um, so now that you have the knowledge, uh, we hope that you'll um, you know, uh, opt for another uh, solution in the future. Um, and... Uh, Another thing to note is that, you know, if you live trap an animal, sometimes people use have hearts and then they dispatch the animal with a firearm. You need to make sure that you are um, not discharging that firearm within 500 feet of a house, that's state uh, regulations. And then also look at your town ordinances because certain towns have different ordinances around surrounding firearms uh, because all of our towns are very different uh, in their layouts and, and how, um, and, and where people are living. Oops, I move forward here. Um, and then we also want to talk about rabies vector species. This is uh, very important, especially with uh, some of these critters. Um, so our rabies vector species are coyotes, foxes, raccoons, bats, woodchucks, believe it or not, and skunks. And, and you know, a bite or a scratch with any wild mammal 
whether it's a rabies vector species or not, is a potential exposure. Deer can get rabies. Um, you know, any anything, any mammal out there can get rabies. These rabies vector species are just a little bit more susceptible to picking up the virus. Um, so it's uh, it's imperative that we do not handle any wild animals. Um, do not do what is happening in this picture right now. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is what not to do. Um, but you know, sometimes people find uh, mammals, little baby mammals. Oh no, I found a, a little tiny raccoon. It's orphaned. What do I do? Um, you know, you find a little baby squirrel or what whatnot. Um, if you find an orphaned animal, you can always call uh, the wildlife rehabilitators uh, clinic of Rhode Island, and their number is in the chat. They are wonderful. Uh, they will help you tend to rehab her out. Uh, they've been an amazing help. Um, there's people all over the state who are ready to help out. Um, but it's important to note, you say, oh, well, the animal's not foaming at the mouth or isn't really aggressive. Does it have rabies? Rabies can exhibit a wide range of symptoms. So that could be really aggressive to um, drooling, to aimless wandering, being really lethargic. Their back legs are weak. Um, you know, they're just kind of not really aware of where they are. Um, and some bats, like uh, some animals like bats, typically, it get, sometimes they don't really show any symptoms at all. They have to go through a lab test um, scanning the brain to, to understand whether or not they have rabies. Um, so, and that's not to say like every single raccoon that you see is rabid, every single bat that you see is rabid. That's absolutely not the case. Um, so you don't have to worry. If you see bats fluttering around your backyard, um, you should be happy to see them. Uh, they're, they're doing their work, um, but you don't have to be fearful of you know seeing these wild animals and thinking they have rabies. Even if something is out during the daytime, doesn't necessarily mean it has rabies. Coyotes, uh, during um, the season where they're rearing their pups uh, in the spring, they are constantly out on the prowl to get something to eat because the puppies are so hungry all the time. If you have children, <laughs> or teenagers, <laughs> you know this, uh, that you know, you're know you constantly <laughs> carried, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get the kids some food. Uh, so that's what the coyotes are doing. If they're out during the day, it's not necessarily that they have rabies. Um, but that being said, there is a rabies hotline number from the Rhode Island Department of Health. It's 24 hours, you can call at any time uh, to say, you know, I've been exposed uh, to a wild animal. There was a bat in my home, uh, what should I do? And they can walk you through the next steps um, because sometimes, you know, if a bat, if Abby and I are sitting here and a bat just flutters by us, we can open a window, we can open the door, let it out. We know we didn't touch it. It didn't touch us. Nobody was bitten. Probably don't need to worry. But if you're asleep and the bat is in the house or it's found in a room with a child, um, you know, a small child who can't speak yet or with a pet, obviously, who can't tell you if the bat landed on them, um, that's when they would probably recommend you uh, and your family for rabies vaccines. And if you're able to capture that um, or you find a bat dead in your home, um, you're you know able to submit it uh, for testing. Uh, that's that's when they would advise you that way. Um, so in bats and rabies, we we had a lot of calls about bats and rabies. Um, you know, in houses, what should we do? Um, less than one percent of all bats have rabies. And when Department of Health tests the bats that have been found in homes over like the last ten years, the average positive testing of all the bats that they get, so it's like over a hundred bats a year, it's four percent test positive of the ones that are taken in. So usually. And you might be like, wait, so 1% of bats have rabies, but 4% taken in have it. That doesn't match up. But usually the ones that are submitted for testing are ones that, oh, I found it dead in the house or, oh, it's really slow moving. I was able to capture it. Um, usually a healthy bat is like, woohoo, you know, fluttering around and difficult to catch. Um, so that's um, that's why that that percentage might be a little bit more um, for the positive testing in the, in the DOH lab. Uh, so... I will also mention, I won't go super in depth into this, but there is um, there are uh, seasons on small games such as raccoon, gray squirrel and red squirrel. Um, we are in that season right now. It goes until uh, the end of February. And um, there are bag limits and methods of take that you can use. If this is of interest to you, we have a very detailed hunting and trapping abstract, which you can find online. Uh, there's one of the, uh, the 21, 22 regulation guide with a squirrel. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about hunting and trapping, we have a phenomenal hunter education team um, with basic hunter and bow hunter safety courses. There's a trapping workshop, uh, small game mentored hunts. So if you're like, I'd like to get into hunting, I don't even know how. Uh, we have mentored hunts available um, so you can go out and like learn hands-on. Uh, there's archery proficiency testing. Uh, they've got a wild game cooking class. They have uh, land navigation and wilderness first aid. So even if you're not a hunter, 
there's a class in Hunter Ed for you. Uh, if you'd like to go outdoors, you could, everybody could use a first aid class um, or land nap. I get lost all the time. Uh, so <laughs> I stay on trail. I don't know. <laughs> I don't go too far. Um, so those are all um, on our website as well. We have upcoming events on the um, DEM website. Uh, so last but not least, um, you know, we have to think about carrying capacity when we're adapting for resolution. So um, there's two different types of carrying capacity, biological and cultural. So biological is what nature allows, right? Uh, how many coyotes can uh, nature provide for, or Rhode Island's you know, landscape provide for with food, water, shelter, open space? That number may be pretty high in comparison to the cultural carrying capacity, which is how many coyotes can the community tolerate or be comfortable with in Rhode Island? Um, and as you can see in this uh, pie chart, it's a little blurry, but this big blue section, I use coyote as the example because this is the percentage of calls we get about coyotes, followed by foxes and woodchucks. Uh, like I said, opossums, they just don't do much. This little <laughs> tiny sliver up here is opossums. Um, but, you know, the, these, you know, the larger, larger uh, animals usually get a lot of calls. Now, it's really important to remember that while raccoons and bats and squirrels, they could be really annoying in our homes. They can po pose a health issue if they're in our homes. Um, but out in the ecosystem, they are, um, you know, they, they have a role, right? Uh, so raccoons, um, you know, are what we call a meso predator. So they're omnivores, they're eating lots of different things in the environment and act as small predators um, from a, you know, a resource use standpoint, um, they are trapped for fur and some people do even eat them. Um, uh, bats, you know, are helping to eat mosquitoes and agricultural pests. Squirrels are a phenomenal prey species for literally everything <laughs> in Rhode Island that is a predator, uh, all the way from, you know, great horned owls to foxes to bobcats. Um, and they're also acting like little foresters out there in the forest, planting those acorns, forgetting about them. Uh, and then we uh, resulting in, you know, a regeneration of our mast bearing trees. Um, so at Fish and Wildlife in our little tiny office here, we receive over 4,000 calls. Um, Sarah, our chief implementation aide, tallied them up uh, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, so there was uh, 4,200 calls in, in that time. And the vast majority of them are related to nuisance wildlife questions um, or reports of injured animals. Uh, you know, those depend on the season. Um, so the goal of this session and our sessions that are going to be running into 2024 is to equip you with a resource uh, some knowledge about these animals um, and the role that they play in the ecosystem. So we don't view them so much as a nuisance, uh, you know, because people might look at a raccoon and be like, ah, they're just annoying, right? You know, no, they do have a role to play. Um, but, uh, you know, when they do become a nuisance, having those tools uh, in your back pocket so that you know uh, what to do, who to call, uh, and then, um, you know, working your way from there to help solve those conflicts. Uh, so with that, we will gladly take uh, some questions. And this is a, a little um, sketch done by Sarah's uh, dad, actually. He probably has heard many stories from her <laughs> of all the calls that she gets. Um, so he did this cool little drawing of a yard that is an attractant for wildlife. So you can do this, um, you know, looking at this picture, looking at your own home um, in community. A yard audit. A yard <laughs> audit, right? And you're like, oh, there's a brush pile. Oh, the shed door is open. Oh, there's all these things happening. Um, and thinking like a critter and seeing what would attract you there and then fixing those those problems. So we are good to uh, take some questions. Uh, you can either toss them in the chat, you can shout them out loud, um, 